we saw that the main issue about environmental ethics, environmental philosophy, when we say philosophy to be so big, and when we make it environmental ethics, then it means we are specifying the branch of philosophy that deals with rightness or wrongness, goodness or maybe like badness or not what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. So we know all the contentions that uh, border on ethical concerns. So when we say ethics, immediately you know the, the minds and the, you know, the thoughts that come to mind. You remember Kant, there will be utilitarian, there will be some pragmatism, some relativity, holism, and what have you. So that alone immediately should tell you what you are anticipating when you do uh, environmental ethics. Okay, and so on the screen, I see that I have projected introduction to theories God bless you, in environmental philosophy generally before we launch closely into the ethics side. This one you saw also, so to do a fine mock up before we move to the other slides that has equally dealing with environment issues. Okay, so we saw the technologies there and I'm not allowing you to talk too much because you did a lot of very good, good, good talk in last week that I'm very impressed about. You see the non-anthropocentrism and the anthropocentrism thing. And then under the non-anthropocentrism, we see all the versions of it. Ecocentrism, biocentrism, deep ecology. I think it was Asari that helped us so much on this particular and the centrism, something centered and then the biosphere thing and the ecology and how you, when you are overly centered and I mean, not overly, but when your emphasis is on the ecology at the center and the biosphere at the center, you see all those ones with the instrumental view interested in, we should forget I mean, the issues bordering on environmental ethics, environmental philosophy. It is really fundamentally, what is philosophically interesting in that you know, field of study is what? Whether nature is morally considerable for its own sake, that's key, or it is so insofar as it benefits the human person. We saw that also nicely. And then the question, the funny question, if you like, that tried to put that question in perspective. If I were the only human being left on earth and I decided to end my life or I was dying, would it be a problem if I had a scientific way with that to blast the whole earth and destroy everything, other living organisms, the rocks, the oceans? If I had that ability, and I said, well, I am the last person and I'm also dying, so after all, there is nothing else left to be useful without man. Will that create any nerviness? Mm -hmm. Will it create any problem? Because it helps you put that question, that key question up there in perspective. So you saw that. Another one here, someone who feels that he can just go about cutting uh, flowers and, and stuff like that. Would we think of it as so a wealthy eccentric buys a house in a neighborhood. The house is surrounded by beautiful display of grass, plants. I'm reading from the screen now, and this is taken from Hill 1983, page 211. The house is surrounded by such beautiful display of grass, plants, and flowers. That's nature, trees, shrubs, flowers. And it is shaded by a huge old avocado tree. But the grass requires cutting, the flowers need tending, and the man wants most <laughs> so he cuts the whole up, covered the yard with asphalt. I could pave everywhere. Everywhere. People would sooner than later pave their roofs. Pavement everywhere. It's supposed to be a beautification agenda. Without regard for the natural, you know, and nature and it other. So these are the political problems for some. I just don't think there's any ethical problem, like I've told you. After all, it was his property, and he was not fond of plants. The thing be mine. The thing be your problem. How I do one. These are not human beings, so to speak, <laughs> who are agents. Look on your screen now. And therefore, worthy of moral consideration. These are 
trees, keke. Some even hit the heart to each end. They say, <laughs> you hit something, and then when they say, oh, it was just a dog. And you can hear the dog, hey, 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 you know, going, and it's like, oh, it was just a dog. Not even a, a little pack to see, pack aside and check if there was anything at all you could have done to help that dog. It's just like, oh, who wastes their time on such? Okay, whenever we have that line of thinking, I just want to say this for us to love, or for us to be, well, not to love, but to a bit, be a bit more reflective about the whole thing. By the time we ended our class yesterday for main campus, one student raised their hand, a fine gentleman, and said, I want to make a food with that. Or can we just sedate, for example, animals that we must for some reason eat? Can we just sedate them before we take them through the ordeal of killing them? It should tell you that something had twitched or something has shifted place in the person. You will have to eat. But if you would put the cat in a sack against it will or in a drum of water and cover it and put stones inside for the cat to hustle its way, trying to survive, drown to death for you to eat, that can be perhaps callous for some. Okay, even if there we go now, even if the person may agree with anthropocentrism, which is what is on your screen, that man is the center. Man should be here in the generic sense of man and woman that is, should be the focus of considerability. The status that is given to right and wrong, uh, you know, uh, moral standing, we are getting there shortly, should be as a man we are dealing with a human person. If it is a non human person, says the non anthropocentric being, then we will think of the the interests and the welfare of that animal or ocean or trees or whatever you think of it, yes, we regard it, yes, but only instrumentally. We think of all those and seek the welfare of the flowers, the skies, the ecosystem. We will do all that only insofar as it benefits the human person. We saw all that last week. So, so it would be very much anthropocentric, yes, but they would think that we should have some respect for the sentience of, say, non-human animals. And so that will be the next slide that will mop up nicely. But just get the trip right at the stage. Uh, being anthropocentric may not necessarily mean that you see animals are machines, which is one of the views that some non, uh, some, some, some anthropocentric authors emphasize. They think that it's all about the human being because after all, animals are like machines. We saw they got the automata, automatas. Those who have read it would have already seen the other slide and engage them. Okay. He is, but in a way that perhaps you can interpret him as thinking that animals don't have any uh, You know, we, should, we shouldn't think they are just like machines, treat them like the typewriter in your office or something. When it gets poor, sometimes you get angry and you hate it to the ground, or if you remote control, it's not, you can throw it somewhere. But but there are other anthropocentric authors. They still think that man is the center, yes, but they also advocate for the welfare. Mm -hmm. So you will see that that other slide that you are supposed to be engaging talks about direct and indirect uh, welfareism, and then whether that necessarily means right. And those are the concerns of that. Other presentation that I do. Okay, so and, and, and human being. check the language because when we go to ecofeminism, which we discussed extensively, you will see that this is the concern. It looks like the racist thing. So the one that is propagating racism seems to have some superiority complex of a kind or a patriarchal kind of system. The man that now the masculine man, not the generic man. Man thinking that he has some dominance. That's why I want you to look at the language dominance over other human beings. A woman, she does. So if you get it, then you will see why eco feminists argue the way they do that. See the discrimination against nature, in other words, other components of nature, as the way that man or the, the men are 
discriminated against a woman as the way that, if you like, the colonialists would discriminate or suppress, you know, the colonized. And so it is the same line of reasoning by the same tokens as opposed to resist any oppressor's rule. And so stand with the rest of nature to correct that false superiority complex that human beings have or pretend to have over the other beings. And so if you get this line on anthropocentrism very well, then you are able to pull out you know, the, the extent to which the ecofeminists find such parallelisms in, in man's domination of human and human beings' domination of non-human animals. Any questions before we continue? These are all mop up, mops up, uh, excuse me, I'm mopping up, but I'm also making sure that we fill in any gaps that we may have. And then we are hoping that it will entrench what you did very well generally. They interrelate that you can connect such thinking and reflection on the environment to the other uh, you know, content that we have dealt with. So I want to know if you have any question, please raise your hand. If not, then we are good to continue. I will always be looking out for that. So if there's a question that you can do raise your hand, just to be sure. Oh, I'm glad to see. I think I see T. Mauli from online. Good to have you today. Uh, Portia, can you hear me, please? Let me see if you are there. We just logged in. <laughs> hey, Portia, <laughs> are you there? <laughs> Auntie, yeah. Portia. Hey, Auntie Portia. You just came to sign up now. You are selling a young. So, Portia, respond. Otherwise, I'll think that you have just, uh -huh. Portia is there. I just saw her blink. <laughs> OK, so we continue now. Now, on my screen, you see the economic terms. And so jokingly in class, I told you that someone just sees uh, you know, the river body or the ocean, the waterfall, and all this is economics, how we can make money from it, or how you can do galaxy around that. But they see, you know, the cow and how its you know horns are sticking out. And they all they see is how they can use the cow or the bull to harvest the crops and get so what they think a bountiful harvest and they are not really seeing the other part of that animal. So the animal rights versus animal welfare is slight, which we, I hope we'll be able to pop up with actually is connected to this. And the focus is on the animal in that side. Why? Because perhaps we can see some some likeness between the human person and then who is an animal in the scientific sense of it versus other animals which are not human animals. We all give birth. Of the, the ocean maybe we will not see the, the pregnancy of the ocean or the, the, the suffering of the chair you are sitting on or the rock. You know, but when you hit a dog, either intentionally or unintentionally, you hear it. What? You know, you can hear it. When the goat is in labor, it cries. In fact, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll make you laugh. Have you seen a cat experiencing orgasm? <laughs> it's so annoying, eh? <laughs> if you have an eye the next day and, <laughs> and you are preparing to go and write uh, whichever eye you find interesting. Now, the pressure is that then the cat is at the back of the other, and then it's so annoying. They have feelings, both, both um, uh, supposed feelings of pleasure, and then the one that expresses pain. Because of the similarities, how the, the bird gets busy creating a nest, it's just like the way the sister who just got married and is pregnant and suspecting a baby goes out there to shop, get the baby caught. It's, they're painting the baby shoes, they're expecting a, a girl, they will do pink. You get ready to receive the dead bed, also does that. It goes and picks the, the twigs or whatever, one by one, and creates a nest. All these words will just come and settle up there until it is about to lay eggs. You see, so, so you cannot, says those who are happy that, you cannot treat the 
the bed, the dog, the cat, the snake, the, you know, the fish, the big fish. I like the ones that we can easily connect with. You can treat them like you would treat the stone a river body because they, they have sentience, they feel, they suffer. Perhaps they are not agents, okay? And that is why I've, I've kept this slide for a while because I want you to see the anthropocentrism that only sees economics, money, means of livelihood. When they see nature, that's all they're seeing, is the one that will create a lot of problems. The welfare of the animal and its interest, if it is fundamentally tied all the time to the human person without regard for the welfare or interest. Because if you think of things only in economic terms, do you care the means you use to arrive at that? Look at the water bodies and how they get destroyed to, for people to get money in the name of galaxy. Yes, you see that. But the same mining could be done in a way that protects the water, which is essential, and still pull out the gold. That is what we are trying to see. So if it is viewed in economic terms, that human beings are unique, and not just unique, they are superior. And then look at that, then not just unique and superior, it can be superior and yet you don't impose your superiority on others. You will keep quiet on what you, but look at the second one. They assert the dominance, dominate. Shesso, you just subdue it. Then if you are not careful, people won't mind at all if they have to sedate the animal, dope it with so many, you know, uh, uh, you know, unpleasant drugs in the name of testing for its efficacy. And they are killing the animal really. But who would they used to check that in the name of finding researching? So the concern of how to mitigate that likeness will come up again. But you have to understand how anthropocentrism could be manipulated or used or interpreted depending on the author you are reading. Some are anthropocentric, but they make room for the welfare of animals, either directly or indirectly. Some are anthropocentric, they don't think you should look out for anything like welfare or whatever. The focus and the duty is owed only to man. You'll be amazed that some have interpreted scripture, the holy scriptures, that way that the creation and every other thing was made for man. I said some have interpreted, I didn't say that is what the scripture says, because I don't see that when I read. You were given that to dress it and keep it. Dress it, make it better, and protect it. Yes, you eat some, but protect it. So it cannot be that, but that is the interpretation that some have given that everything in nature was made for man. And so look on my screen now. So the instrumental value, the thing is valuable. Yes, that's nature, that, not man or human being. Other creation, other members of the environment are valuable. So the thing is not about whether they have value or they are important or not. It's accepted by all, oh, whether anthropocentric or non-anthropocentric beings, that nature, apart from man, is also valuable. Except that that value is instrumentally given. And I've explained instrumental thing as I there again in the ecosystem, did a beautiful job on that. So an instrument helps you to get something done. So it is a means to achieving something a higher value, a higher value. And so the rest are considered valuable instrumentally. But when we come to intrinsic value, then now you are in your, uh, you know, that brings it, brings it closer home, right? Because you are the philosophers, you are the moral philosophers, you did that, presumably. And so you understand Kant, the basic underlining, you know, discourse on intrinsic value, inherent value. Not just valuable instrumentally, but valuable for the thing's own sake. And this, at least for Kant, is tied only to the rational human being. Mm -hmm. By your human beingness, the dignity of the human test is defined in the fact that human beings possess inherent value. Man is good in himself, not for what he does or what he is able to. So you cannot use man, I say here man in the generic sense, you can't use human beings as a means to attain in any end. I think I use some funny examples as well. I said, don't get pregnant and tell the guy that 
because of the pregnancy, you must marry me because of the baby in the time. You are using the baby as a means to attain something, to get married. It's a joke. Or can't, that is not right. You can't use a human person as a means to marry. So if you got that, then it shows you why the human person has moral status and therefore is worthy of moral considerability for his own sake, not because of what it gives or what you get from it, no, but because of that. And therefore, we have a moral obligation or a duty. All these are, is now moral philosophy, I'm reminding ourselves of the language, the duty. It says can't, you, know, you owe the human person the duty of what? Uh, avoiding harm and, and, and ensuring that you pursue only those things that are government. The person's intrinsic well being. So, I mean, how much talking I'm doing. Now, we saw the non anthropocentric, we want to move now. The nature of intrinsic value, we have seen that. I think we saw all this too. Yeah, it's important to look at some of the points here when you read. Okay, so like point three, many have pointed out that it's possible to reject anthropocentrism without positing. You can, you can, that is an argument line or something. They reject anthropocentrism and you will not. So you think around them. They are just, because the philosophy of the look at the perspective that some may put and why you think they may be right or they may be wrong. And what your view is, that thought, very important. Something that tends to have intrinsic because nature has purpose. Purpose, tell us. So it's as if it's not only the human person that has intrinsic value. This is a like oceans. Ocean is valuable for what its purpose is. Human beings cannot be the habitat for fish. They get inside where we crucify them and they become pasty or crunchy in our mouth. But they can't survive living alive in the human being. They live in water. So it is actually the purpose of water, the ocean, the river, the water we use, may define its intrinsic value. For those who argue for some kind of interest for nature, that's point two. You can look at the rest so that it informs your critical evaluation of those views when you educate me. Right, so I think that you can do that. And we went to individualism versus holism. I don't want this social and political philosophy just represented in the environment discourse. That's all. individual. So you look at the individual species. Basis when you look at the whole, the whole, the whole ecosystem. And here again, we've six did beautiful job there. Just read through them, you pass the English, and you should get the various perspectives, land ethics, and all that. Okay, then some non anthropocentric theories. Look at non anthropocentric. So it's not centered on the anthropo, the man. It is not. It means it looks beyond the human basis. Some say human beings are part of it. So in, in fulfilling our uh, obligations to the whole species, man to benefit. Okay. Man, humans are a part. So take care of the collective, the environment, that species, or the ecosystem, whatever it is, and man will benefit. Respect everyone, point three, go my screen, point three. Respect the entire natural environment, the biosphere, respect all. And by doing that, man will benefit. You know that the debate between communitarianism and individualism. Okay. So you, you transfer and connect that those ideas where it matches and then you do. They don't want you to have a, a look at the, the point the point I'm expressing in biocentrism, the entire nature is respected and inherent to worth of each and every species, including humans. See the point. Regardless of its uses and hierarchy, it's valued. So we value all. We are not concerned about who is at the top or who is at the top. Just make sure that the thing works well. Stay the, the soaking. So make sure that the sugar goes to every place. The granite will get some and the garden will get some. So when you scoop, you scoop 
something that is benefiting or no hierarchy is at all. All right, the rest you can read, I'm sure. So you see Paul Taylor there, it's all under text. The land is a community and people are members. We've seen our things that can move now. And then some more on land text. Then ecocentrism. It is also nature centered. Look on my screen, please. The view the ecosystems matter in their own right. And look at this. I think there again, the group six did well with that also. And individuals have value by virtue of the contribution they make to ecosystemic functioning. Okay, so it focuses on the, the whole thing. Ecocentrism believes that there is hardly any difference or division between human and non human. That's the point. It believes in equality among humans and non human organisms with their internal association. With them. They believe that humans are part of the entire organic and inorganic, biotic and abiotic. Oh, they are all one inside that. I think that you may want to show the deep ecology. I use this one. This, this was when I gave you some examples about the, the way people see, as I say, the earth as a woman, as I say, yeah, it, it's deep ecology. See, it's deeper. It would be like, well, if you speak the, you know, the Christian language, you say deep, call it onto deep. So you are not just looking at the surface kind of discussion about take care of nature. No, this one is not just nature as a physical or something. In the other tree or river. No, you are seeing a river. Someone is seeing their father, their ancestor. If I pray for someone, it's not just a water body that you can mine from. No, they see a father. You think you just saw a dog. Someone sees their totemic, you know, animal that represents them. So when you get the, the dog, they are cutting off its head. For someone, you are hurting your family. Think of it that way. That big tree, before it is cut down, some see that they are going to dislocate the nanomum for the ancestral group. That is what they see. They don't see trees for you to go and pass it on to another generation that you come and inherit. No. Or we are cutting all the trees here to pave it. No, you are you are destroying. So the relationship, look on my screen now. Deep ecology considers humankind as an integral part of it. Environment. You are integral, but that is not too much different from what you've read so far. But why deep ecology? Look at the next one. It emphasizes the interdependent value of human and non human life, as well as the importance of ecosystem and natural process. There's an interdependent Gaia, Captain Planet, the woman, Earth. I, I gave you those scenarios in class so you can. Moana, the cartoon Moana, the whole story. It shows you a certain relational tie that the human beings on that island have with the water. The water could even speak to them, so to speak. If you are sensitive or you are the chosen, that can hear from the gods and pass it on. When people see elephants, some people see elephants, they don't see one of the animals in the bush. No. And so that is a deeper version. Which means, as you throw water, as you, excuse me, you, you litter around with as human excreta water around the beaches, or some, bosompo, bosompo, it means uh, the, the sea, the sea god, is what you are, you are, you know, uh, offending like that. And the, the way they relate and they depend on the interdependence is affected. It's not like a physical thing. Necessarily, whatever we want, you know, take note of that very well. So, see, deep, deep ecology says, uh, like humanity, the living environment as a whole has the same right to live and flourish. The ancestors have a right to their groove without any disturbance. You don't enter there. Sometimes you say the evil forest. You don't enter there without their permission. What are you going to do there? Do you like it when people invade in your single room, self contained that you are put curtains on and put your key at the back? Why are you why are you entering that? So, so before they go there, they blow a horn and they are crossing the river body or something because they are cognizant or they, they want to recognize that that is an invasion. This is someone's who, not just a water body. You come and put a bridge on it. You see that I'm trying to show you the understanding. And where people relate that way with it, they can go and sit under a tree and say, 
uh, this asthmatic attack. They were coming sit under the train and now this sapped out of new UDA you were there before I came. He's not talking to a tree, he's talking to supposedly <laughs> uh, you know another living organism that has endured years and years, maybe it was there 300 years before he was born. He knows the so just that the expect medical doctor may have a certain wealth of experience and the houseman, the one who just joined, doesn't know. You acknowledge that and then for some it works. Maybe there's a scientific explanation to that, you never know. You know the oxygen coming from the saps out, you know, the carbon dioxide from you and they so there's that is scientifically explainable to us now. You know, when you lay under the tree there before they, they attack this. Perhaps we can have a scientific What it goes it's not like I want you to get that. You may not be saying, but we all care about your believing or not believing. It's not believing it's a philosophical examination of the viewpoint about how people see nature and why some can't afford to cut, cut, and it go and read how they take over. They just are vegetarian because of how they think the cattle. There's an ancestor come back. You want to cut your ancestor's eye and put on a plate and you see that. So, if the people relate that way, then perhaps. It might have influence on aspect and stuff like that. So humans have no right to reduce this richness and diversity to satisfy their vital human needs. That is deep ecology. The infinite value of both human and non-human is independent of their usefulness to each other. And we can go on and on. The task is to read all and see. You see how much time I spend on some of them? You should already give you a clue. My heart beaches. You should be able to show the philosophies that we are engaging. And their influence on climate change, you know, preserving the environment. To what extent do we have to eat lab meat necessarily? Can we live without clothing? To what extent can we say we are protecting nature? Then we will not take a step because if we move, we may be stepping on a ground. <laughs> so we have to interrogate the matter as well. So, Find that we get feminism and those perhaps if there is any no, it's not get to see a line down mother to your left, just a symbolic expression. And mother, according to the co feminist, is always presented as a woman. The argument to show why the earth is not a man in language, in, in the push to. Of the earth. So the earth receives, you put stuff inside for it to grow. What you put in the soil is what you do. You, can't, you don't put pepper seed or if you like mango seed and go harvest banana. No, what you put in is what you pluck. But the thing is, you pluck good measure, press down, running over. <laughs> so you want to be careful. What you tell the woman? See the symbolism. One man was the thing is connected to feminism. So, a ecosystem or you are studying ecology, but the line between the two says the feminist. Okay, so we are trying to. Tell that in them, and then we are done. Then you can't have an excuse. I moved up nicely. Have a reference point all the time. You put something in the woman. She brings it. I mean, the process is a drop, tiny drop of water, cold, whatever. Spend. Hmm? It comes out by the time the woman nurtures it. So you see the nurturing abilities of a woman. Mm -hmm. that you see that. Hello, Doug. Okay. 
I want to highlight this. So by the time Roman brings that out, what should nature look on my screen, please? To give them that it will come to screen, but it's not my Yes, sir. I can. Um, yes, um, please, your network is, is not stable. Okay. Yes, your network is not stable. Hey. <laughs> Damn. <Someone. laughs> Yes, please. Is it mine or somebody else's own? Or everybody's own? Uh, uh, please, I'm not able to hear you clearly again. Is it so for everyone, please? And since when? Is it yes, Doc. Yes. Let me, let me. I can hear you, sir. I can hear you, sir. Oh, I'm using the office cable. Then, so when it goes there, let me know, okay? Is it better now, please? Is it better yes. now, please? Yes, please. Okay, so when it's yes. all right, that's fine. So when it goes, I'm in the office, I'm using the office cable, the direct one. So if we still have challenges, then I may want to use my hotspot or something. Just prompt. But thank you for that. Has it been so for a while now? So where did you message? The whole show. No, from my end, I think for the past one minute. <laughs> Minutes where you are. Hey, right there, you are let you. Let you, let you, let you. you thank you for the prompt. And then that's that's very helpful. So just when it happens, so please prompt again like that. Okay, so that we keep it there. Because you need the that's why I'm not asking you to contribute anything. I want you to be straightforward content that you can reference easily, you can go to and pick for your for your revisions. Please. So you see that I was just saying that reciprocity so what you give to it is what it will give you back you don't plan to tomatoes and go plop for poor yeah that is like a woman back when i say it it's just to symbolize nature when you put rubbish into the ocean the ocean will produce rubbish for you when you go to fish for you, you go fishing by the time you come back there'll be pure water rubbish all over you as a fisherman <laughs> and sometimes they get disappointed but where did the pure water come from we threw it there. Maybe you threw it away in far away, not or eastern region or Bruno, but it drained into some water body, or the flooding came and then took, took it all the way to the sea. Now you won't fish to it in a Kumasi or wherever. The fish that you are waiting to eat, what you will get will be the pure water rubbish, plenty. You get only small fish, and so fish will be expensive. I'm just giving those. Um, so the earth reciprocates. gives you It's like a woman. I, I gave you so many examples. It says the feminist kid. You saw the woman Okay, it will come back not only a reciprocation of the one slap you gave, but come nurtured using from the sperm that was inside the match, you will give you a human being that has eyes. And what you put inside it didn't have bones, didn't have any shape, there was no flesh, it was just a drop of liquid. But by the time it is nurtured, so if you put two, two seeds or three seeds of corn into the soil, before you, knew, you, you know it, the earth will produce a corn. Is it a tree? Corn water, it has to be corn something, but whether it's a tree or a shrub, I don't know. <laughs> and on it will be corn cups. That's the point. If you get the argument like you understand why the eco feminist argument is care and what you well into that water body. Let it worry you because as you express such things to the earth, to nature, as you hit the dog, if you see the dog and you see breakfast, stop our night, it means when the dog sees you coming, you are going to endanger it. So it becomes wild. These are all until the indictment line of the uh, fence, the eco feminist. They also think women. They cooperate. And so nature will cooperate with you. You you sail on the sea and it will not be all turbulent like that. It will not rain and then 
there's flooding because you know if we are respecting it and allowing the water you know the water park to be water park you don't go and do your estate development at the flood I always think of where the the the, the pathway of the water no one will go there eh? well you go and build it then you now you don't understand why you know, there, there is flood stuff like that so what you are giving you will reap bountifully and they are using the symbolism of a woman to show that okay you can love and generate that and that is where we saw the animals see how uh, it looks like the dog and women symbolic of a very healthy relationship between animals trees flowers whatever and the human race, the woman for that matter. This is what one of you read in class, and then we are done with this slide. Then this, the next slide, I will let you do the talking whilst I enjoy the session. Okay. So on, on the first point on this screen, this is slide number 32. I went back. Women and nature united through their shared history of oppression and patriarchy. It's a shared history of patriarchy. I've seen that two people have dropped. I don't know what I may do, so please prompt your colleagues. I am interested in attendance, like I said, okay, for your own sake. I don't want you to do it's just an online degree. Sometimes I hear students say that in class. Oh, don't you have another class? Oh, it's just an online. I say, hey, that's not here. <laughs> so that's what you say. When <laughs> the class is where I say, oh, join Anna. Please have muted you. Keep it muted. No, it's just an online. Really? Online is just affecting the same person. To get your beliefs, to get your beliefs. You didn't know. Or maybe it's, they just dropped out. They are sharing a gadget. I'll take attendance. Conceptions of nature and of women have been linked. Earth as female, female as earthly or animal. You don't want to get the anger of a woman. You will see she's like an animal, especially when it has to do with her children or the, what she's protecting. Look at the chicken. Protecting its chicks against the hawk. It doesn't care about its strength. It will fight. Is animal? That's how women are. Says the uh, 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 these gender folks. Generally speaking, like I said, there can be uh, variations of a kind. But generally speaking, the woman looks on as human until you touch things that are. So the head harbors all, excuse my language, all nonsense. The river bodies won't say anything when you're throwing stuff inside. They just keep collecting and collecting and collecting until they set up to resist it. Then you will see that they knew what you were doing about this. Okay, so devaluation and abuse of nature and women have gone hand in hand, says the uh, feminists. To overcome this problem, we must analyze and resist both together and devise an ideal which liberates both. That's the argument of and that is the conclusion is what I'm so keen on sharing with the feminists. All oppressions, see, that's a fine way of making a strong case. You don't want it to be like it's just a special issue about uh, ecology, nature, and no, no, no. after they make all the arguments for nature, they show you that their argument line, the principle is true for all oppressions, whether racial, whether class, whether gender or environment, and therefore they need to be fought together. And that one may be very appealing to a lot of people. I'm done with the first slide that we already engaged extensively in class. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so I think that we are good on that one. Now for the next slide, which is now putting the discussions in contexts on animal welfare or what have you. You may want to raise your hand if you want to read for me. We are going quickly. How many of you saw that before you raise your hand for that? How many of you saw that slide? You attempted to look at it at all. The one on animal rights and stuff like that. And welfare, animal rights and animal welfare. Oh, I'm projecting my vision, sorry. <laughs> Please, how many of you saw that one? Very quickly, so that we move. Your hand. Nobody. Okay. Do you know that there was another set of slides there? You know? 
Did the class know? Yes, Doc. Hey, you want to hear yourself the way you are responding, no cry. <laughs> it just no. that. It's like the knowing is not knowing. Like, oh, don't do that in your class. I beg you. Maybe it escaped you. I can take you there. Let's go ahead. You see, um, I'm on I'm I'm on Sakai now. Let me project. There is a way you go to get folded properly, not for everything uh, environmentality because of the peculiarity of the animal as uh, a non human animal. She, as human beings, are human animals. So we give some emphasis to the discussion around animals. Anyway, if you want to read, can you read your hand now? Awards of marks will be individual. Not complete. Okay. So if you will read for me, please put your hand up. Yeah, I also can't see. I haven't projected yet. I'm still projecting because you before okay. have not read it. So I'm, I, I'm looking for it on Sakai. But my point is who will read? <laughs> Raise your hand now. By the time I finish projecting, you can read. And then, All right, please. Um, which one will be showing now? Just a minute here. Please, you see my screen for the second set yes. of slides. Yes, okay, please. Perfect. Okay, the animal. Yes, who is reading for us now? Oh, there's no hand up. Oh, I didn't want us to waste time. That's what I asked. Please read your hand very quickly. Ra raise your hand very quickly so that we do the animal rights. Object, I, I'm projecting objectives very quickly, friends, so that we can move in. So there are key things I want to touch on to help you. Do you know how to raise your hand or something? <laughs> hey, Emmanuel, your people don't know how to raise your hands. Look at the top. I, I'm, I'm just joking. I know you know. Guess you go ahead. Thank you. Objectives. To explore the major theories and debates in the global animal ethics debate. To understand the difference between animal welfare and animal rights. And three, to assess arguments for and against the moral agency of animals. Five, eight, four. To come to an ethical appreciation of what ought to constitute a good human and animal relationship. Very good. Thank you very much. Sir. So if you look at the, the objectives, 
you are supposed to explore the major theories and debates in the global animal ethics debate. This one is the animal ethics one. See that? We want you to understand the difference between animal and animal rights. So that is, please check with if you can find out or someone is to understand the difference between animal welfare and animal rights, and this is important. I've already said oh, when I was going to the previous slide, animal welfare, animal rights. One is their welfare. The other one is the question of whether it is a right. I can seek your welfare as my student. And for that reason, attend to some concerns you have even been up to class. to do with schoolwork, yes but you don't have a right to my time after office hours. So it's not a right as an, an entitlement you have. When, for instance, you send me a WhatsApp at 8 p.m. <clears throat> and say, oh, dog, please. Uh, so so uh, can you have a look at this quest these questions since I attempted whether I, I did a good job at them? I may look at it. And I say I may, I, I do look at them if I'm able to most of the times. But it is not something a student has a right to write, an entitlement. No, because it is not a duty. You see the language I'm speaking now. Remember all the emphasis I gave when we had to present to them a moment ago. I referenced Kant, moral philosophy. It's not a duty I owe you. I hear referring to the instructor. The instructor doesn't owe you that duty to, to invade their privacy after office hours. Some send me some at 1130. I'm even called. Hello, doctor. Uh -huh. I was asking that tomorrow's class here. Do you think we should and say, hey, what until you are offer? I have a family. Even if I had nothing doing my life, I need that space for myself. And then we laugh. So it is you can be pursuing the welfare of someone or making an advocacy for its welfare animal. Okay, the focus is on animals. I said because human beings are also animals, but we think human beings, when I say human beings are animals, please, if you are very sensitive religiously, don't get offended. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. <clears throat> I'm speaking science. But I already told you the non-human animal shares so much in common with the supposed human animal, you and I, such that some make special case for that specific species of what nature environment, which is what animals, especially we will put the argument for that, but especially those that are domicile, eh? not correct, the domestic ones. You see them, you live with them. Sometimes it's difficult to even kill them to eat, like cat and dog, maybe for some of us. My particular others, they might not all since the animal is passing by. They saw lunch, it's just lunch in the making. That's fine. Okay, so is it their welfare I'm seeking, or it is a right that I am insisting that must be enforced? That debate is very strong in the animal, okay, like global animal ethics debate. Okay, your friend read that. Then we assess the argument for and against the moral agency. Uh, Animal supposed to be agents. Look at the word. I say you are philosophy student, so it makes most of our work <clears throat> easy to do. We are not addressing the the, the non tutored philosophy, the moral agency. Okay, agency in the moral sense of it. Okay, not uh, not just agenda. So there's a reason why the human being. Is the object that grass cutter entered my farm and ate my my corn or something? I don't arrest the grass cutter and take it to court. I don't. I could hit it with some club, some hard stick over there and suck it out. But I don't get busy. If I'm bathing and the goat comes to carry my soup away, I don't chase it, trying to prove a point that it has stolen. It is a goat. It is not able to make uh, to be accountable morally. It's not an agent in that sense. So you 
you see that as we open up the slides, there is excuse me, moral agency. Patient, like a woman, come to the hospital as an agent. Why? Because the doctor's name has that know how, is able to make informed choices. And so sometimes you may be the patient that is receiving, uh, <clears throat> is receiving the, the, the health that is being administered. And, and you are likely perhaps ignored in the decision making because you are not an agent, you are not accountable. Now, the debate around that is, are you sure, says some people, that animals are not agenda? Are, are they just sentient and therefore not rational, moral agents? Some think, no, they are. And the extent to which you strike that argument will inform the extent to which you think that we owe them moral duty. As for the welfare of the animal, it will be difficult for any version of if you like environmentalists to deny it the welfare even if you are preparing it for it to be fat so you eat it you know in an african family some some would say that uh, the witch if you had a witch mother and i'm sorry but something that if you had a mother that was a witch some would say if, if your mother was a witch why would she not kill you when you were a baby in some respondents because at that time i'm, I'm not big enough <laughs> to be enjoyed. Have you seen any poultry farmer kill the chicks to save breakfast or lunch? They take care of you and allow you and you know do all they can, just like the farmer, the poultry farmer will give the feed so that what does radia when you get flesh and uh and the radia in your system then <laughs> then you become ready for edibility. Now if you think of it that way. So even the welfare is to say that even if it is for my sake as an anthropocentric discussion is what I'm saying, it is for the sake of man, but I, I should still be interested in the welfare of the animal, even if it is for my sake. Okay, that is the point. So no one, whether the animal welfare is anthropocentric view, uh, whatever, uh, non-anthropocentric view, would rationally argue that we shouldn't look out for the interests of an animal at all. I don't think so. You see from the discussion. Okay. So it is not in it is the talk about rights, entitlement that may generate the contention and furthermore then the supposed agency of animals also. That raises questions. So we will hope that by the time we go through the beautifully put together slides, we may come to the conclusion of what an ethical appreciation of what, what constitutes a good human and animal relationship. Okay, so please proceed now. So the rest will be reading. I've done all the uh, presentation and the highlight. So we'll just read to it. Okay. Question, please go ahead. You're muted. Do animals the animals have rights. Are humans animals equal? Are animals moral agents? Is there anything morally wrong in the use of animals, food, or for food, for clothing, for research, for hunting and sports, for pets, etc.? I don't want to go through that. I'm sure you know what it is. If it is for food, like some small sausage and chicken caca. Man shall not live by bread alone. But bread is in man's. <laughs> that one, it is difficult to, you know, object wholly. See that. Some may say, well, I'm a vegetarian. Well, the fruits that you eat or the vegetables grew from sometimes killing words, uh, cocoon, what have you. So some way, somehow, perhaps unintended or not direct, but you would have to some way, somehow, cause some kind of harm to some animal. Even the clothing you are wearing, okay, the woolen, whatever, the leather shoes and belts and whatever. I mean. So food, clothing done in a certain way, the how is the issue. 
you want to eat food and it might look like, well, that's harmless. You did your best. The little you can eat is what you went for. You didn't waste it. It's fine. But how you do it? So I, the, the cat scenario comes to mind again. Put the cat in the sack, hit the sack, boom, then the cat is on meow, boom, meow. Because you want to eat. Or you pull the chicken, pull the chicken and pull the leg back. They threw it into the warm water, another one back. And what do you go? Dead. I mean, dive it into the warm water so that it will, will be going on to serve maybe a thousand uh, you know, folks that want whole chicken grilled. And so there seems to be no sensitivity to how you are even getting there. Maybe some few days, you take your time, you let the animal avoid struggling, you know, it comes. And so a few days to kill it, you feed it a bit, you give it some water. The animal knows that it is dying. It is on its way to the cemetery. It knows. But at least you respect that and give it space to before. Unlike this surprise, you boom, on you the that is very offense or hardly triplet, just like human beings. It has a a lot of things like a human being. You want to let that way. So you are, it is for food. Yes, but I, perhaps you want to have it so that it doesn't raise too many questions of morals uh, and so on and for the others. For pets, you enjoy them. For hunting and sports, use them to hunt. Or you, uh, at some point, point, point yeah. uh, something in class. Sometimes you just shoot at them to show who, who killed them. We do like it if you don't study. As we get with our treatment of animals, says some of the authors. It transfers after animals. The next thing is some blacks that have been lined up that way for some superior bosses to shoot them and show who shot at them first. And these are human beings now because you do it with animals and it looks like it's normal. Okay, so you don't want to practice that. Look on my screen, please. I'm projecting one side. So some are advocating for the welfare of the animal, and some talk about the rights. That's the generic. Look at the welfare, the welfare of the Look out for the interest of the animals, but allow this interest to be traded away as long as there are some human benefits. So you trade it away, the interest of the animal. If there is some human benefits that are worth the sacrifice of trading away, the animal's interest. Okay. The, the mosquito wants to eat. Oh, yes. You are afraid of malaria. Well, the mosquito is hungry. <laughs> Something. So you, if you are not careful, you say, well, I have to allow the mosquito to grab that. Then that, that can be. So you may have to trade off the supposed interest. Perhaps the mosquito doesn't look too nice an example. People don't think there's any interest to even trade off. But think around that. The second point on your screen, keep looking, please. Where you can avoid unnecessary harm. When there is an avoidable harm, eat, we must, no problem. But should you? Eat the cat. Sometimes it is not that you in the south, you come back and or deal with that. Yes, so that is when uh, your colleague on main campus said, oh, I propose that we just sedate the animal. So it's doses of, when it's dead, they, I don't know the scientific uh, implications for that, the blood flow and whatever, but the thing is to avoid the struggle. Then the imminent, you, you see death coming like that, then you, you can't do anything. It's too callous, says those who advocate for that. Okay, so all these are talking animal welfare, basic interests. Now, the next slide. Please don't go and do next slide, next slide, like I'm doing. I'm highlighting the things that will help you. Your duty is to engage all the slides in tandem with the raw text that I've been giving to you. The, the, the readings are there. The slides are supposed to be pointers. So that if you want to know what Peter Singer said, more of it, then you go to Peter Singer. The whole reference text is there, either an article or a whole book or a paper. It's there for you to just go and see it and then enrich yourself. This is level one. Slides are pointers to help you. And some won't even go through all the slides because they think, oh, dog, oh, do, I can say, hey, hey, 
let's move on. I'm not going to write an exam in level 400. I did that years over a decade or say, this was a two decades ago. You are going to, <laughs> are going to write an exam. So don't put up that attitude. Respect you. Okay, I just want to point out what you did. So the animal welfare is will emphasize the humane treatment. That's point two on my screen now. Treat the animal humanely. Let your mind go on to the fact that this one is also a being that suffers. Look at the third point. Suffers. It goes through pain. If it sees it's it's a kitten, eh? What, are, what is baby cat? Am I correct? Hey, it's a baby cat. Hey, everybody. Hey. <laughs> if you see the car knock its babies like that, it feels it. Just like you would have felt it if you saw that. If there's flooding, you see the cat. I keep using that. You, it will go down there, pick the first baby, climb all the way into the room, put it down, come back down, pick the other one. It will do that. And it's so wild. Just like your mother would have felt if there is a fire outbreak of flooding and you are on the bed there. She's going on like they are holding it. She said, no, my baby, my baby, my to the, the extent to which it will go. So you want to be minded that these ones are free. I'm not think all about it. Do it. Or feel when there's a stick, excuse me, stick on your table. Meat, eh? Or do medo. Chicken, and you don't feel guilty. But those who are this way, you haven't done anything. You have to eat. But look out for the welfare, the interest. Treat the animal mainly. I think I've said all that. So those who say do that, they are arguing for the welfare of the animal, but they're arguing directly. They say, because as you do that for the animal, you care for it. You are concerned about whether its plate has been washed, the water that the dog brings from. You want to change it and all that. You will see that you will transfer that same kind of caring, respect, treat to your fellow human beings. So cruelty and inhumaneness. If you can walk away, drive away after you hit a dog or a goat, a pregnant goat, and it's like the leg is broken and you are gone. You say, oh, it was just a, a good. If you can do that, you can do that to a human being. They are saying that's the point. Okay. So they say, so as you develop the attitude, the posture of being interested in the welfare of the animal, it will be an indirect way, you see, of learning how to care for the human being. So you see that it is so anthropocentric, but it makes room for looking out for the animals interest what have you in so far as it benefits the human person the normal she said that, that is the point so it's indirect welfare is looking like you think you are doing it for some if you do good you do it for yourself kind of so you give it to the beggar the bread but that good was for yourself because there was poison in the bread after all that in your bed to give it to the beggar the beggar will eat and die maybe but you benefited because you only express kindness. That kindness to the animal will benefit you. That's the indirect welfare is okay. Descartes automata is what I have highlighted down here. Okay. He thinks that, at least that's the interpretation given to him, that animals are like mere machines. I think that he will say that now in his screen. <laughs> I doubt. Animals are not like your typewriter or your remote control that you are unhappy about they can throw down like that if you throw a cat down that way, you see it close in your eyes you try it so i mean but that is so more on the indirect welfare reason. we see all things that you may want to categorize as like that because of how they argue now so see aquinas saint aquinas the, the, the religious boss taking from christian if you like christianity or Taking from faith and making the case that the Christian theology maintains that. That is St. Thomas Aquinas. It gives that indication. Okay. But you can support that, I think, if you ask me wholly. That is my view. And others like that. Your, your task is to read through and see. Then there's the direct way of welfare. Yes, you read this last one, then 
to put it with them at a certain day. We are out of here. Go ahead, sir. Types of welfareism. Di di direct welfare. I have moved. Please, I've moved to. I'm on. You can uh, see my I'm, slide there. Eh? No, I'm on, I'm on the second one. Second point two. Uh -huh. I mean, Please, yes. Please. Thank you. The direct welfareism. They hold that duties are owned directly to animals. This, this is the path preferred by utilitarians, starting at Jeremy Bentham and John Stout Mill, and giving more force in the work of Peter Senga. To say humans have a direct duty to animals in general understanding is to say that it matters how humans treat them. Very good. I, I just want to point out here that the use of the word duty may create an ambiguity here because we speak philosophically when we understand duty coming from the categorical imperative of what you're doing, all centered around the intrinsic value of the human person. So you treat the human being as an end in himself and not as a means to an end. And therefore, you owe the human person the moral due to the moral obligation to protect, preserve, and enhance the address, stuff like that. Now, if anyone is arguing for the welfare of an animal, and it is a duty animal, or attract some criticism, do you think that the animal owes that, or is entitled, uh, whatever, by right? See, the indirect welfare is, may not have to deal with too many problems. Ethically, remember we are doing philosophy, we are not doing a, a, a people, what's their name? Those who inject animals, what's their name? What's their name? People do not, they say, oh, the animal, how you are teaching him? No, no, we have to make sure he's injected. We are not injected. It's not that. The interest is in the ethics. The rightness or wrongness of what we are doing, the principles underlying the philosophy. That's what is of interest to us. So we want to know that if you went or argued or based your demands on an indirect welfare approach, then you may not have to really deal with whether it is a right they have. A student needs to know if tomorrow is high the investment of mine is asking you at 8 p.m. It's not a right he has to your time, yes. But maybe. Since you are the instructor and you look out for their doing work, generally speaking, you may be interested in helping the student do well. You see that? So that, that sounds like you're appealing to humaneness and not necessarily something that the student claims she has a right to. But if we talk right, then the lecturer will lock up. We don't pay her beyond that time. And she has a life too. She has other things that she should be humane towards. So you can't take all the time. So as soon as you make it right, right, then there's the, the debate because what should we eat? That's our environment. What should we eat? If you have the animal has the right to life, now we are, we are going to eat lab meat. So uh, the direct welfare is may have the issue to deal with yeah, the issue of to the question of whether there's a duty at all. Something that for the sake of the human being, we should look up to. And for the fact that we want to treat ourselves, we want food that is not fermented, and all that, we need to better go and better on generally. I don't know. So see some critique of welfare is that you must look up to. Now, are humans on my screen number is are humans and animals so are humans and non-human animals alike at all some don't think so like coherence argument now so everything he has said in addition moral harm in the use of animals how you use them using them because we don't know who's to test the person of 
whose which human beings some should we go and test the efficacy of that vaccine? Some countries are going, and we have said a lot on that. We have a lot to add. See, Ghana is interested in taking pragmatic measures. See, pragmatism, so utilitarianism, we see Kantianism or the deontological. No. Take pragmatic, actual grounds decision. He in fact emphasizes political strategies. Make policies. If we see your dog on the streets without the vaccine card and something on its neck, you will pay a fine. If your dog's poop is in the garden after you come there with it to walk it, you you will fine this one. So, so that interested in how they house the dog. Now, the singer and animal liberation, look at that. Liberate the animal. And then that text for that book he wrote, the book he published, look on my screen, makes two main contributions to animal rights. See the language rights, not just welfare, but the entitlements in moral duty, moral entitlement. What is it? Consider the animal's rights, he says, because it, it is also sentient, like you. it feels, it suffers. Hmm? The treatment of animals, especially in a Greek, where did you do the, the pull up, that's the pulling of the thing, the yoke. Eh? You, you are praying that God should bring the yoke of your children. You are putting <laughs> you are put a yoke on someone, you have become a tax master on someone's. Father's life. It cannot play with the son. It cannot breastfeed its baby. You take the babies away and you come and milk its breast milk and go and give to your human beings. See, we have all become uh, baby cows. Go and drink the breast milk of babies. Eh? <laughs> anyway, that's just uh, for you to learn. So the point is agriculture and scientific experimentation is the key contribution that Peter Singer's Animal Liberation book. Seeks to stress on. See, some more there for you. Keep looking. There's just one more thing I want to point out. And then I'm done. So, Abigail, you do have the evidence when I get to that slide. Sentience, I've mentioned this, uh, is a capacity to have feelings. You need to. I can't tell if the chair you are sitting on has feelings because it, it doesn't share some things with me, a human being. So they may have feelings that I'm unable to tell. Maybe the tree cries. I don't, I can't tell immediately. But the dog and the goat and the sentience is almost obvious to us, the way we humans behave. And I've given you some fine examples to relate to. And therefore, if they are sentient like us, then even though they may not have be more, they may not have moral status or have rationality. Remember Plato, remember Kant? They are all connected. They may not be rational, but could sentience be enough a grounds for us to talk of they having rights? Just like when the human person is sick, I'm sorry, but mentally sick. Eh? They might not be rational in that sense of it for us. That's why we won't take them to court. But we don't think that because they are mentally sick, they are right, you see, have, have disappeared. We still with children, babies. We, we think they have entitled, they have rights that we must regard, even though they may not be uh, moral agents for that matter. Okay, That is something like what the, the, the folks want to argue for. The fact that they feel To ground their yeah, entitlement to rights. Okay. Otherwise, if you are not doing that, then the argument is you are being a speciesist. So, Abigail, would you want to quickly please read? Okay, let me show you the speciesism. Hey, well, otherwise, we'll laugh at you. So, on this screen, we have species, Peter Singer and Animal Liberation. Go ahead, Abby. Very quickly, please. Abigail, yeah, go ahead. Peter Singer and Animal Liberation. Fishermen, species, sorry. Singer describes. I 
Singer describes those who take seriously the interests of human beings but discount those of animals as species. Species, species, men. Hey, sorry. Species. <laughs> okay, species. Species. Them, the, species. Go ahead. Species. The idea that being human is a good enough reason for human animals to have greater moral rights than non-human animals. Very good. Is, so it is like ethnocentrism. You see, like our ethnic group, whatever that means, I have to take that, it's not clear. It's better than the other. So my group, my, my species, my species, the one I belong to, has um, a good enough, how do I say it? I think of us as superior to the others, and therefore you should do things that favor our species because we have some additional supposed eh, quality that the others don't have. We all feel, but it's like, oh, don't regard feelings. Patience is not enough. Rationality, whatever that means, is what matters. Now we get mad. I said mad intentionally. I'm not describing the mental sickness. I want to say it in a way that addresses the concern. When the person is mad, you admit that he's human. Why have you kept him safe? You give him food in the morning, go and clean their room, you take them to hospital. Even though you know that they are not rational, see that, or babies. When I say they are not rational, they are not applying the rationality. The same way, you do that because you respect their feelings, the fact that they are feeling. And they have relational others. So if you are able to do that for your non properly functioning human being, when they put in a put terms of rational, then you should do the same for the animal. Respect the fact that they feel. Don't make your species, which has some extra character, you know, a higher one. That will be species. I will ask you in the exam. And you will answer. Amen. So we go to argument against modern way of farming animals. My lady, thank you, Abigail. And we have a problem. I've said all that. These are just more content. They give the drugs to the animal and addict it. They want to see how the human being will behave if he or she's addicted and how that can help the scientists find a response. And you use the animal. And sometimes they get so addicted and tired and they're looking for the drug again and you are not giving it and it kills them. Very, very, very unpleasant. These are all in Peter Singer's animal liberation text. And he urges all of us to become moral vegetarians. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so you, <laughs> so you see now, you've had species and we are ending. Uh, Emmanuel, oh, everyone, patient, I want to end nicely. So you've seen species, you know a lot about food feminism, you've seen direct and indirect. Welfareism. We've seen how welfareism may not necessarily imply uh, animal rights, and how the other the authors are arguing around that, and what they are emphasizing. It's not so much don't eat the food or don't wear the clothing, but when it comes to medical research and whatnot, you have to be sensitive to this. Of the other Otherwise, you commit species. See the connection nicely. Now, one more word. It's moral. I've already mentioned, but I want to touch on the agency and the patients, like one is an agent, that's one capable of choice, moral choice for that one. And the other one is just a recipient of that kind of agency. Just like you become helpless when you are in the hospital, okay, and you are not able to uh, say anything. Uh, sometimes you just have to allow the patient to have the showing of the, the doctor to have it. You put someone father in the zoo and see everybody coming. Do you like it? If your grandma is sleepy, <laughs> there's where people come and throw bananas at you. Because of her hair, it's all white, not common. We think it's fine. Something, you know, whether for food, sport, or entertainment, on our screen now, zoos, circus, and scientific experimentation animal rights of a certain type. That's why I have to focus on food like we did with Russia. It's specific or certain. I think all of that is a no-no. Don't do that. She does. 
can have a strict one. Then there are the others who say no, no, no. Because they are animal, they also have their essence, like emotion and what I said. So it's okay if you are using a pet animal for pet parrot. But what would be problematic if you cage it in a way that it can't fly around? Because you want it to be there to display all that carrier aquarium and you put the fish in that. The fish wants to belong to the ocean. And with its communal habit, you are going to take two of them. How can we put it in your hall? You know, stuff like that. Those who have real life fish is what I'm talking about, not the make you fish. Okay. So some would want to extend the same argument that Kant makes for human beings. And says animals should be included in that big bracket and be treated as an end and not as as a means to read the rest and as you see from Reagan, he's advocating for complete abolition. <clears throat> Don't reform anything. Stop it, says Tom Reagan. It's a complete ab abolition. Uh, so you see that he's called an abolitionist every day. Okay. Uh, 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 so they so many authors down there. The way I speak, sometimes <laughs> I think I'm doing that because it, I think it's because you so far for four and seven you, you have earned that you do a lot of the work, so it's easier for you that I'm topping up and mopping up nicely for so your screen. All these further elaborations. Now, the last one do animals become a subject? Okay, a subject of a life. How I wish you could read or read it and we meet or, or, online as we do elaborate a bit more. But one is receiving, mm -hmm. experiencing, as the other one is giving. Let's find it here. So to be a subject of a life on your screen now, please, according to Reagan, from Reagan, yeah, is to have beliefs and desires, perception, memory, and a sense of the future, and to also have an emotional at least the experience of pain and pleasure. Animals are moral patients and also subject of a life. Hence, they also have an inherent value that is valid, not because of how valuable or useful humans find them. They have their own aspirations. I told you the bed, I get busy preparing its baby coat. They have their desires, they have their memories, says Tom Reagan. I don't know if he knows what it is to be a bad and, <laughs> and experience emotional life as well. That one, I know of the cat. I told you, and it's orgasm. It's annoying. You would think it is hurting. Like, oh, it's, so, it's so irritating. <laughs> but well, so that's Tom Regan. Moral agents and moral patient. This one, this slide, I leave it to you. I will ask you questions on that. So one is an agent. And the other is a patient, supposedly. And Tom Reagan strikes that maybe, maybe Abigail read this one and then I'm done. Shut up. Tom Reagan and animal rights. Moral agents yeah. and moral patients. Moral agents are viewed as individuals who can determine among given alternatives. What morally ought to be done? They what are really morally ought to be done? See, what morally ought, 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 not what is done, but what should be done. They are moral agents. That is why sometimes we want to take out children and idiots. They are human. But when it comes to moral agency, when your little girl, maybe one year, two years, goes to stand on the in front of the TV screen and we wish, you know, the boys can do it. We wish all on the screen says, Daddy, or takes your phone and puts in the bathtub and say, Bubbles, you know. You, <laughs> what would you do to that child? You should have picked the phone and put it somewhere because the child is not able to determine, that's an argument, what morally ought to be. The capacity may be there, says Plato, but it hasn't matured enough to be expressed or it is restricted by the physical body. That it is, you know, trapped in the real person is trapped in the body that restricts its split. Okay, because of all those arguments, when it comes to moral agency, children and idiots who are even humans are exempted. How much more the animal? Because it's not able to take. Now you see that we are able to exempt the child 
at the individual who are humans who and still treat them as human beings, respect them. But when it comes to moral agency, we understand that they are not accountable. The argument is animals could be placed there. They may not be able to determine what ought to be, but they have other factors that you must not ignore. And therefore, rights and entitlement need not necessarily be tied to agency. Something like that is what Tom Reagan is doing. So look at the moral patience bit, Sister Reagan. In contrast, moral patients in contrast are considered to lack what is required to make them determine or control their actions. They cannot consider what morally action to take in any situation and cannot be held morally responsible for their actions since they have no sense of morality. You know that, Never so continue now. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, Moral patients, even though cannot be agents of moral actions, can be affected by people's moral actions and thus can be morally harmed. That's the whole point. So remember how I have showed you our treatment of babies and, excuse me, mad people or idiots. And understand that we understand that they can't be morally accountable. That is, they can be moral agents, but we don't use that to claim that they do not have rights. That's why there are pedophiles. If you hurt a, a child, you know, you molested a baby, who is oh, just a baby? It's not a right. We talk the rights of the baby, even though we can admit that the baby is not a moral agent. If so, then we shouldn't be speciesist when it comes to animal and see who are true, they are not moral agents. So what? Don't they have something else? Do we want to be, uh, you know, uh, what the ecofeminist say, domineering and superiority complex and you know, imposing ourselves on other parts of nature, especially animals that are so much like us. That is where I end. And I think that we can share the Campus is racing is bottom. Yeah, we are we are done. So if it cuts, we are done. <laughs> is there any question, please? Okay, let me end the recording. We are ending, but just so I know if you, you heard me to the end, uh, I seen an aqua media. Aqua, please, can you hear me or some more coffee brown? Yeah. Anybody can hear me now, please. I just want to. Stop. Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Did anyone hear me, please? I want to end. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So that's fine. So we are so done. I'm ending the recording. I hope to share it to the host. I wish you uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. And let's prepare for the next online session. I'm going to the last stream on uh, my question. Paper and submit before the due date. No excuses. All the best and take it.